I also want to read now to you in Romans, and you can read along, Romans 3, 29, we're going to begin there, and we're going to read into Romans chapter 4. 3.29 says, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, and it's talking about Jews, and the uncircumcision through faith, and that's Gentiles. So we come into this kingdom a little differently because of the covenant. But both of us are grafted into the Abrahamic covenant, which is now made into the new covenant Yeshua brought. The Mosaic covenant has been fulfilled. That was the law, the Torah. It's been fulfilled. And the covenants before, the Davidic covenant, that was fulfilled as well. But the Abrahamic covenant was forever, God said. What shall we then say that Abraham our father pertaining to the flesh if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory not before God. But for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed and it was accounted to them him for righteousness. Now, he believed that was by faith. And by faith, he was circumcised as a sign of the covenant. So, verse 10. Um, how is it then reckoned that when he is in circumcision or uncircumcision? And he, verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So Abraham actually agreed to this before he was circumcised. And I want to take a sidebar here in the Greek language. The interesting thing about the sign of the circumcision it is the Greek word semion, and it means a mark. So, you know, we hear about the mark of the beast. Well, God put a mark into Abraham and to all those who are circumcised as a sign of the covenant that he made, that he was going to bring the Messiah. He was going to bring redemption. Now, Romans 2, 28 and 2, 20 and 29 say for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly you know the circumcision of the flesh neither is that circumcision outside the, on the flesh but he is the Jew who is one inwardly the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter of the law whose praise is not of men but of God so here is another powerful key in understanding the New Covenant. It's that you are no longer um, a Jew because you have a circumcision in the flesh. Jews still do that today, but it ha means nothing regarding the covenant. It's no longer the sign. And so, we who are believers in Messiah, we receive the mark of the Abrahamic covenant inwardly and our hearts are circumcised and this is why Jeremiah pr prophesied in, in uh, chapter 31 that the new covenant was coming and would not be written down but it would be written on our hearts and in our minds and the sign of that would be an inward circumcision of the heart isn't that beautiful Galatians 3 27 says for as many of you as were baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is now neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor male or female, but all are one in Messiah. And if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's offspring according to the promise. You are his heirs. So even if we weren't Jewish, now, because of Messiah, we are grafted into the Abrahamic covenant as well. And it's interesting, he says, there is no Jew or Gentile in this covenant. So, you know, that is not a, a, an indicator any longer. The circumcision is inwardly. We can't see that in other people, but we will know by their fruit uh, whether they are of the covenant. Also, it says there was no male or female, and this goes back to my teaching on sex, the original sin. God created them male and female, and that to me did not mean sexual, but they were gender. But now, after the sin, 
male and female took on a new connotation because they took on sexual parts. But God is bringing us now into the completeness, into the wholeness of His new covenant. Now we're back spiritually where the gender is not decided male or female by sexual parts any longer. We are equal in Him, in Messiah. Colossians 3.10 And having put on the new self, our new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of the Creator, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but Messiah is all in all. Now, it mentions here in the English that we are being renewed in knowledge in the image of the Creator. I dispute this. I have come to believe that knowledge is never a good thing. Now, before you uh, go into cognitive dissonance on this, let me explain. Remember, the one thing that God told Adam not to partake of was the tree of knowledge. Why? Because as the serpent tempted him, well, you can know as much as God. Remember this, knowledge leads to sin. And I'll tell you why. The pursuit of knowledge can lead to what is called um, Gnosticism. That's a Greek word that means the seeker of knowledge. Gnosticism is forbidden knowledge according to the scripture. And knowledge, the, the pursuit of it, can lead to occultism. Occultism means hidden knowledge. And science demands knowledge and learning, which leads man into that same seduction that the serpent had, that you can know the deeper dark things, and eventually you will perceive that you don't need God, because you know more than God. How many scientists today who are studying quantum physics and, and you know, some of these uh, string theory and all of this stuff, they are not believers, they are agnostics. Some of them believe in a divine uh, plan, some believe in a grand design, but many believe in evolution, Big Bang Theory, whatever. Very few scientists are able to pursue knowledge and still hold a submitted reverence to the Creator. I do not believe that knowledge is translated properly anywhere in the Bible. And in fact, in this particular passage, Colossians 3.10, or 3, uh, yes, 3.10, the word there that is translated knowledge is epignosis, and it means discernment. Now, I, I'm okay with that. I believe God doesn't want us to seek knowledge, but He wants to impart to us wisdom, understanding, discernment, if you will. The root word of epignosis is the word uh, that means a mark. And there you have, again, that same word that was referring to a circumcision. So, um, we really need to get a different uh, picture of our relationship to the Creator. It is always in a submitted position. We are never equal. We're not on the same plane. We are never above because that is Satan's desire. I will ascend to the throne of God Most High. Remember, it was the tree of knowledge that led to the destruction of the human race. Knowledge is not a good thing. Wisdom, understanding, discernment. Those are the blessings of the Lord. It is still His desire. And so in conclusion, remember that His flesh was bruised for our iniquities. The flesh that was tainted in the garden. His blood was shed for our redemption. The blood that Adam and Eve took upon themselves when they partook of the tree of knowledge. And the day is coming when we will be redeemed and it says, corruptibility will put on incorruptibility. Mortality will put on immortality. That means we're going to return to an Adamic state, I believe. No blood, because as Jesus appeared after the resurrection, he said to Thomas, see that it is I myself, flesh and bone. No blood. He shed it. Because blood makes 
you mortal. And we're going to put on immortality so there can be no blood. There will be no sin because there's no blood. And this is the promise of the new covenant. And the when we are in that glorified state, we will not be sexual beings. We will be as they were in the beginning when Adam was made in the image of God.